I'm from New Zealand, and hence my slightly strange accent. Um, what am I doing in um, California? So not quite as far as from New Zealand, but still uh, a little bit of jet lag kicking in. Um, I am the semantic architect for the J. Paul Getty Trust. So uh, I deal with metadata across all of the programs, which are listed there on the bottom of the, the slide, um, such that they get connected up. So if we have information in one um, program about, um, say, conservation of art, and an archive in the GRI and the object itself in the museum, how can all of those things link together in a way that the developers don't really need to understand how the magic works at the back end, they just know um, how to get it done. So, um, without further ado, um, shout it out loud with the emphasis on the U. So, Back in the day, probably 99, 98, um, there was this notion of the semantic web in RDF. Uh, great idea, fantastic idea. Uh, has this notion of graphs that all interconnect, the open world. Um, it made us really think about how we model our data in a way that it can connect with other people's data um, or within the institution uh, like we have at the Getty. It also meant that we had to start thinking a little bit more beyond just a relational table in a database with a single user interface built in HTML on, on top of it. We had to deal with this distributed nature. Or we thought we would have to, but really, the semantic web was just imagined. It never really came into being. Um, it gave us all of this lovely framework for thinking about our data but it didn't give us a practical way of actually doing anything with it. Um, it was lovely for academics. There was millions of papers at lovely conferences, and there still are, but it was never broadly adopted as the semantic web. And um, the, the cover, thanks to, to Ruben um, of the Scientific American, uh, says, you know, tomorrow's web will get the idea, and it does but it doesn't use the semantic web, it just parses the natural language in the human document web. So then comes linked open data with the uh, well-known five stars of excellence. Uh, and this is fantastic, it, it says that um, data must be published on the web, uh, it must be open. Uh, it, I, there's no need to explain the stars to, to this crowd. So it promotes standards as a necessity for reuse. Um, it promotes uh, linking between systems, between data instances as necessary for reuse. But it sort of looks like a smile of a crocodile to me, and it's coming to eat something. <laughs> or maybe the arrow goes up, but then it stops. You know, what, what, what happens next? So all of the five stars you might notice are about publishing and none of them are about consuming the data. None of them are about using the data. It's all put it online in this way, <laughs> but no more. Where, where is the other five stars um, of, of using the data? It's like um, our Lord Tim went up the mountain, got two tablets, dropped one, whoops, <laughs> never mind, comes down, here is the, the five stars of linked data. <laughs> So the web community has started to recognize this, that we need some other mechanism for uh, defining what best practices are um, around linked open data for the consumption rather than for the publishing. And if our data isn't used, if it's not consumed by different applications, then we're really not getting any advantage of their resources spent in publishing, uh, in maintaining, in updating, and curating that data um, in a relatively technical way. So if we want our data to be used, we need linked open usable data, loud rather than just LOD. Uh, and I would argue it needs to be designed up front to be usable. Uh, we can follow all of the standard best practices for ontology management and end up with a perfectly semantic clean data model, but that doesn't imply that it will be usable and therefore that it will be used. I think we can all think of uh, example ontologies that are overly complex um, and hence ignored. So 
what do I mean by, by usable? Uh, in the, the true spirit uh, of pretty much every presentation these days, I'll turn to Wikipedia uh, for its definition. Um, usability is the degree to which a thing um, can be used by specified consumers to achieve their quantified objectives with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in a quantified context of use. Right, a little bit of a mouthful, but to break it down, who, so specified consumers, that's great, tick consumers, they want to achieve what? Uh, well, their own objectives, quantified objectives that they can state, this is what I want to do with your data. How do they want to do it? Well, effectively, if you can't do it effectively, that's not so great. Uh, efficiently, if you have to spend more resources than are needed, that's also not great. And with satisfaction, it should be a happy, joyful experience to work with our data, and that's very rarely the case, I would say, these days. And also importantly, I, I would say, in a context, it's not that our data is, although in the open world, it's not without context. It's within the cultural heritage context. It's within the museum context. It's within the library context. Um, we need to understand the background in which that use is occurring in order to be usable uh, by, uh, by others. So, um, yeah, unlike the very objective of publishing five stars, we really need to take into account these factors um, for determining usability of the content by consumers rather than by the publishers. So the key takeaway here, usability is defined by even and dependent on the audience rather than on the publisher who is consuming it rather than who is putting it out. All right, so who is the audience? Well, when I first started thinking about this, I, I came to the idea, well, it's researchers. And it very broadly, it could be a, a, um, a vaunted academic writing scholarly papers for high-profile journals, but it could equally be a high school student uh, with a term paper, or it could be just a member of the general public with an information need that can be satisfied. But I was falling into the, the South Park uh, three-step trap, which I will explain. Uh, so, you start off with linked open data. Magic happens in some middle dot, dot, dot step. And step three, there is profit. Hooray! Or in this case, there is a paper. But this isn't how it works in reality. There is a concrete thing that happens. It, you know, it could be magic. Um, it sometimes seems like magic uh, in that dot, dot, dot step, which is developers. It's not that the uh, researchers interact with the data directly, unless they are also developers. The researcher interacts with a web application that is built by a developer who thus needs to have usable data for building that application within the context of their audience um, such that they can, they can be productive, the data can be used, and the audience, the scholar or the researcher, gets to do what they need to do. So we need this developer role in the middle to translate between the data understanding of the publisher and the human real world understanding of the researcher. OK, so if the audience, and this is a, a big if, I hope you're following along with me on this one. If the audience is developers, then what about the, the what, the how, and the where? And for this, I turn to uh, Catherine Bracey of Code for America, uh, and she has four points that I think are extremely valuable to, uh, to think about. Um, this is in terms of community in general, but it also applies to audience for a particular product or for a particular service. Uh, and these are step one, know your audience. So who are you reaching out to? Uh, who is the audience for your product or service? Um, in a sort of delimiting way. You know, can I draw a, a box around the people that I'm trying to interact with? Step uh, you know, point two, meet on their terms. Don't come to them and say, hey, ontologies, yay, Cytox CRM, Bibframe, simple Dublin Core. They'd be like, what? What? Come to them and say, we have some data. We'd like you to be able to use it to do your job. Um, and speak their language to them 
so that they understand what you can offer them and what they can offer you. Which then becomes uh, the point three, have a conversation. It's not good enough just to stand on a stage, um, and I will try to keep my, my presentation to less than uh, the, the full allotted time. Um, it, it's have a conversation. Have a discussion about what they want to do um, with your data and what you can do to provide that data for them. Uh, and four, uh, create opportunities for meaningful interaction or participation. This one is how to increase the likelihood that the community coheres and sticks around. Because ownership is a very important motivator for these sorts of things. If you can meaningfully participate in someone else's data and someone else's infrastructure, that is, as we've seen with uh, Wikipedia, um, DBpedia, Wikidata, and so forth, it's a very big draw card for keeping people coming back, coming back, coming back. OK, so usability then, Rob, come on, get, get to the, the chase. Um, so usability really is the second part here. Meet on their terms. So it's the audience that needs to be um, the one determining usability. So meeting on their terms means going to the audience, um, explaining things to them in a way that is useful to them. And of course, the audience, as we said, is developers. So what does it mean to explain data to a developer? So the way that um, I like to think about this uh, is that the API is the user interface of the developers. So we have websites, and uh, anyone can use them. You load them up in a web browser, no problem. Um, we have uh, APIs of various different sorts for various different audiences, um, or user interfaces for different audiences. But the user interface for the developer is the API. That's how they get access into your system. Uh, and as a New Zealander, I, it pains me greatly to have to say this, but the Australians got it right. <laughs> so this quote comes from an uh, API guide um, published in 2015 by the Australian government that focuses on the notion of empathy towards developers when building APIs. More recently, this has been expressed in terms of ergonomics, so not physical ergonomics of does the chair sit at the right height, Can, do you have a standing desk, um, but in terms of the digital ergonomics of is it comfortable for the developer to use the API? Is it comfortable for the developer to use the product or system that you're interacting with? Um, so as it says, you know, the same principles of user-centered design apply to the development and publication of APIs as to any other user interface. And that's the key, uh, the key point in terms of usability here. <coughs> so the question then, what is the API for linked open data? And um, I'm sure you all recognize uh, this particular point, provide useful information about what a name identifies when it's looked up using open standards such as, oh dear, uh, RDF and Sparkle. OK, good. So. Hmm. The issue here is that the ontology, which, as we've said, is determined exclusively by the publisher, determines the API for linked open data, because that's what the information is published as. And that is not meeting on the audience's terms. That's meeting on the publisher's terms. So how can we expect to have usable data when we're not doing usable based on the audience, but based on the publisher. So let's go back to uh, Patrick Hochschenbach's wonderful picture uh, that I, I built up. But we'll add in the sort of core metric for success for each of the steps. Right, so the pointy-haired boss, his metric for success is no data gets left behind. Right? All of the data goes into the machine, lots of money gets added in to the mix, and out come these things that he doesn't understand called triples. And as long as all of the data goes in and all of the data comes out the other end in a semantically correct, precise, complete way, he's happy. But that is very different to what the developer needs of usable data. Uh, and the accuracy, well, we all have dirty data that could do with cleaning, so the unfortunate um, Scholar at the end will, will get whatever they get. So we can kind of leave accurate um, 
that's a simple function of time and money to clean up data. But how do we balance complete versus usable? Because those seem at odds, and given that um, the ontology is the API for linked data, we have to balance them in order to get usability. After much uh, research into how to get um, OmniGraphle to produce a Bezier curve, um, I came to this totally unscientific intuitive graph. <laughs> but I think you'll, I hope you'll agree with uh, the, the vague shape. So if you have no completeness, if you have no data at all, no predicates, no properties, no classes, then you have no usability because there's nothing there. You can add a little bit, um, and so as, as the curve starts to go up, that's sort of the simple Dublin core um, 14 elements. Right? So it's good enough to do some stuff, but as soon as you put it in a larger context, uh, you need to know more about the identifier. You need to know more about the description. What sort of description is it? What sort of uh, object is it? And so forth. You can add a little bit more, and the curve starts to go up quite, quite rapidly, um, but it's not very complete. So it's that sweet spot for the developer because it's extremely usable and it's not very complete, so the developer doesn't have to learn very much. But you can't express all of the things that you want to uh, as the, the boss with the, with the data. So at the top, there might, that might be the AAAF presentation API, where, which I'll talk a little bit about um, further on, where you can say stuff, it's reasonably easy for developers to work with, but it's not very semantic. So you, you then curve along a little bit further. You end up at things like the open annotation uh, or web annotation data model, where it's more complete within its scope of effort, but it's still you know, a, a relatively small space. You add some more, you add some more. It starts to drop down uh, until you get to something that is very complete, uh, but also completely unusable. Uh, for this, I would point to something like Cydoc CRM with all of the extensions where you can express beliefs about how many angels can dance on the heads of pins, except pins are objects, not places, and activities take place at places. So the answer is zero according to CRM, but OK. You get the, you get the point. So there's a, there's a target zone that we should be aiming for in our design of ontologies and thereby the design of APIs, which is to maximize the area under the graph. Right, so the most joint usable or the most joint usability and completeness, as usable and as complete as possible uh, together. Even further beyond that, there's the notion of incremental complexity. So if you need that much completeness, then you might end up with uh, that point uh, on the graph uh, on the curve for usability. But within the same ontology, it sure would be nice that if you don't need that much completeness, you're not punished in terms of usability. So as you step back, in terms of the um, instance data that you need to, uh, to represent, it would be lovely if uh, the usability also climbed back up the curve. OK, so given that, what would be five stars of linked open usable data. What would be, if I may, um, a, a projection, a hypothesis, um, about what was on that second tablet that uh, Tim dropped? And I think it's pretty easy, actually. It's as easy as ABC. Uh, well, ABCDE, as there are five. Um, so first of all, the right abstraction for the audience. Um, which, and I'll explain each of these in turn. Um, there should be few barriers to entry. It should be comprehensible simply by looking at the data rather than having to read the documentation, the for documentation, uh, with working examples that you can cut and paste into live systems. And there should be few exceptions. So instead, there should be many consistent patterns that you recognize. Uh, and this comes straight from one of uh, Ruben Verbeau's um, papers about familiarity of user interfaces um, and how we can apply that to APIs. So I, I give him full credit for, for that notion. OK, so I take a brief 
drink. A. Uh, A is for the right abstraction. So a steering wheel, what's going on here? A Lotus steering wheel, even. So a car, we all have a great deal of familiarity with, I imagine. It has various APIs that you can use to interact with it. You know, there's the steering wheel and the pedals, um, the, uh, the gear lever, the you know, gear shifter. Um, and it's pretty intuitive, right? You turn the steering wheel and the wheels do this. And it's pretty, e it's pretty easy to teach, it's pretty easy to understand. You can use the same steering wheel API in a Lotus or in a Mazda or in a, um, a Kia. Compared to the engine, right? The engine also has an API, but it's not for the same audience as for the person who's using this API. It's for the mechanic who needs to get in and fix the internals of the car so it runs. And giving the mechanic a steering wheel is not going to help. Given um, the driver access to the computer that runs the car's engine and lets it do all the clever, um, don't change lanes now because you'll run into something, also would be disastrous. So how do we get this steering wheel for linked open usable data? Right? How do we get the intuitive learn it once, use it everywhere API to, uh, to linked open data? Because at the moment, it feels like we've got this guy, uh, which is a, a steering wheel from, from an old Jeep, uh, which is just bare metal. And when we get under the hood, it seems like uh, it's this ironically named Oldsmobile rocket engine uh, with jumper cables sticking out the front uh, in order to re-jump start it when it dies every five minutes, which if you've ever run a triple store, I think you will understand uh, <laughs> the pain of the engineer. Okay, B is for few barriers to entry. So if we can reduce the cost of getting in to use the API, then we'll get more people doing it. If you have to understand uh, the data model, the ontology, the Sparkle query syntax, how to then send the Sparkle query over the wire and get the data back, how to ask for it in uh, JSON rather than as Turtle, and, 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 there's a huge list of things that you need to know to even do the first thing at which point you won't. You'll go and do something else. So the, if we can reduce the number of things that the developer has to know to do the first step, the more likely it is that they'll continue to learn incremental steps one by one by one um, until they can produce Sparkle queries and do all sorts of clever tricks. Uh, C is for comprehensible. Um, and you'll forgive me the more technical slide. Um, but I think it makes the point. You know, we can all look at that and say, OK, it's got a URI and, and in a field called ID. OK, that's probably the identifier. It's got a type, which is man-made object. Right? That's, that's a class. It's identified by a name, which has a value of example painting. OK, so that's probably its title, its name. And it's made of something with some numbers, but it's an identifier. That's OK. Uh, it's got a label of watercolour and it's a material, okay, so it's probably a, a watercolour painting. Compare that to the, um, the turtle form, uh, which you can hopefully imagine if you understand Cytoxiarium at all, which is probably three people here, um, and all of the uh, individual predicates, cl um, classes, and, and conventions, and you'll, you'll see the point that Talking to the developer in their language, which at the moment is sort of idiomatic JSON as a data structure, gets us a lot further down the road towards usability than forcing them to learn our standards of Turtle and Sparkle and so forth. It's like we expect the, um, a, a, someone coming to our website to understand instantly how to use the API to get access to the content, right? You have hypertext links that you click, and there's menus, and you understand hover, and so forth. But we expect the developer to read hours of documentation, or weeks of documentation if you have to understand CRM, um, to then start to do the first thing. So it's not just, um, is it documented, which is the next point. It's, is it easy to take that first step? Are there, um, based on the data, based, rather than based on the tools, which was the previous one? 
OK, D for documentation. Um, <coughs> documentation is critically important because as comprehensible, as intuitive as the data is, you will never be able to intuit all of the rules that exist in the underlying data set because not all of those rules may even be present in the current data. You know, if there is a limited number of materials, you may conclude that is the only set of materials that you ever will encounter. Then uh, the museum gets a statue made of gold, say, and you know, now your rule is broken. So having the documentation clarifies exactly um, what the patterns are, what the developer can expect to encounter uh, at some point, so that they know what to be implementing against if they want to um, manage the entire space uh, rather than just what currently exists. Uh, this documentation is from the web annotation data model, um, which I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, one of the things I'll point out on the slide is the example use case. That, if there's one thing, or if there are two things, the first one is use cases, um, where you can say, this is the context in which you might encounter this particular pattern. And the second one is examples. If there is an example of that pattern that you can drop into another system and see how it works in practice, then the developer can take that data, change it to fit their own internal use, drop it into the same system, does it still work? Yes, OK, I understood what's going on. No, OK, let me go back to the documentation and figure out what I did wrong. And E is for few exceptions or for many cons consistent patterns like this tessellation from, from Escher. So it's every exception that you have in an API or hence in, a, in an ontology or data model is another rule that the developer needs to learn in order to use the system. So again, it's another case of just lowering the barriers to entry by having them learn fewer rules that are more consistently and more um, constructively used. Because you can put in exceptions all over the place. I can shove a shark in there, and it's very jarring, right? It shouldn't be there. Why is there a shark in the middle of all these birds? It fits. You know, there's the little sharky fin thing. But, but is it that bird, or is it the bird next to it? You know, the developer will have to learn a whole new set of rules about why there are sharks in birds in a bird tessellation, and which shark or which, which bit of bird should actually be a shark, write code to the handle sharks that should actually be birds, and so on and so forth. Right? So exceptions are necessary, unfortunately. You know, not everything is completely homogenous, otherwise it would be incredibly boring. But as few exceptions as possible, or patterns that manage exceptions well um, are much preferable to just arbitrarily throwing stuff in and creating this giant Frankenstein monster of birds and sharks and squirrels and cars and planes. OK, so some examples. Um, and with apologies for the resume slide, um, I will talk a little bit about the web annotation data model, uh, AAAF, and LinkedArt. Um, as use cases uh, or examples of the, the previous points. So some brief history on, on each of them. Um, the web annotation data model uh, was work that Herbert von der Sompel and I started um, in about 2008, uh, along with the University of Queensland and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, at which point we called it the Open Annotation um, Collaboration. Um, we then merged with the Annotation Ontology, which was from the sciences, um, it, within the W3C context of a community group. Um, we went through the community group process, we went through the working group process, um, and in February of last year, we um, got the uh, web annotation data model, vocabulary, and, and protocol to full technical recommendation uh, uh, specifications within the W3C. So that's the same degree of uh, uh, prominence as HTML, CSS, um, any of the other core web architecture uh, specifications. Um, and it's based on ontologies at the back end. Um, it's based on JSON-LD. It lets you annotate arbitrary web resources with other arbitrary web resources of any format. Um, and it's in now wide use, um, both as web annotation natively. Um, one company, Hypothesis, has three million annotations um, that have been created and, and managed 
by their users, all of which are human rather than machines. Uh, Machine-created annotations vastly outstrip that. So I'll, I'll use um, the web annotation work uh, as one example. IIIF um, is the International Image Interoperability Framework, um, and it has been going on for slightly less time. Um, came out of work at Stanford uh, that I was involved with, um, and some other partners, uh, including uh, very early on um, Ecodices in Switzerland, uh, Johns Hopkins, and Harvard in the US. Uh, since then, it has blossomed into hundreds and hundreds of organizations around the world, a consortium of 50 organizations that pay money in annually to look after the community, um, four very robust APIs based on JSON-LD and these principles of usability, um, and enables uh, mil billions of images to be served uh, today um, across the web in an interoperable way, uh, enabling cultural heritage. Our linked art um, is our current work at the Getty and possibly the most challenging uh, compared to the previous two because it involves taking Psydoc CRM and making it usable. And given that I have been uh, poo-pooing Psydoc CRM as completely, wor well, not worthless, it's very worth, it has lots of value, but unusable, this is a challenge. Um, however, by taking some of the principles um, and, uh, and stars that we've been talking about, applying them to an already complex ontology, we can start to drill back down um, up around that curve, up from Cydox CRM inf, up into usable, um, the usable target zone. Okay. So there are then five core design principles that um, we've applied to each of those um, examples. Uh, the first one is require use cases, um, as I said earlier, uh, with real data backing them. The second one is be as simple as possible, but no simpler. The third one, don't break the web. The web is everything. If you're not part of the web, then forget it. Uh, four, define success rather than failure. Uh, and five, design first for JSON-LD and do it consistently. Okay, so each of, each of these in turn. Uh, require use cases with data. So you, you may recall that a um, little bit. Um, so the use cases supported by data keep the ontology grounded in reality. So there's no more uh, hypothetical winged actors dancing on the head of um, little man-made objects. Um, but it also helps find the correct abstraction, A for abstraction. You know, if you can understand what the data, what data you have, what the use cases of the consumer are, when you put them together, that's the correct abstraction. Um, and yeah, it also means that your scope of the work is well defined. You're not going to go out into uh, angels on pins world because you won't have data to support it and you won't have use cases that require it. So in um, the annotation work, every single feature has a use case that we can point to. Um, someone in the community has this. It wasn't actually someone called Alice, but um, of course, uh, Alice has written a post that makes a comment about a web page is a, a very common use case. In IIIF, every single pattern in all of the APIs is driven by use cases first. If there's no data to support it, it doesn't go into the API. And we've adopted that with linked art as well. And that gives us the ability to make objective decisions about where the scope is that we should be worried about rather than the entire universe. Uh, as simple as possible, but no simpler. A quote attributed to Einstein, um, which essentially means do put out what needs to be done, what, what, what you need to get the job done, and then stop. Right? There's no need to put out more and more and more data, the same um, as the, the previous point, but equally, if you simplify it too far and you can't get the job done, then your audience isn't going to be satisfied. So you need to find that sweet spot of as simple as possible, but then stop reducing uh, and, and f keep that sweet spot. So the way that we've approached this um, in uh, the annotation work and in AAAF especially 
is that not only do there need to be use cases and data, they need to be shared by multiple organizations. That if only one organization has a particular need, that's probably not worthwhile making an interoperability standard for that one organization's use case. Uh, the third one, don't break the web. Please don't break the web. Um, and this comes in multiple layers. So uh, first, reuse standards. Right? The, the web is built on top of information standards. Um, you adopt them and best practices, and you'll be going um, a long way down the line. But also use REST and um, resource-oriented models rather than service-oriented models, because otherwise you're breaking web caches, which will then impact your performance, which then makes it much harder to sustain. Uh, the more the more cacheable the um, it is, the the cheaper it is, as well as, as well as being more performant. But also the easier it is to implement, because if you can cache the data, you can serve it by just putting it on disk in the first place. So that makes it much easier to get people in the door. It makes it cheaper to implement. It makes it cheaper to uh, sustain. Define success, not failure. So this is John uh, Postel uh, of Postel's Law. Be liberal in what you accept uh, and conservative in what you send. So when applied to linked open data, um, this means that clients should expect to see extensions and predicates and properties that they don't understand. Um, that's be you know, liberal in what you accept. But publishers should try to stick to the standards as much as possible, be conservative in what you send. So this means that we have an ecosystem in which clients will expect to get things that they, don't, that they can't process, which means that we can be very innovative in the use of extensions um, for doing things that maybe aren't in the standard yet, but we want to prove that they're valuable by implementing servers that, that provide the data and clients that can then use it. Um, this is particularly important for linked art, because as we reduce the scope of CRM down to something that's usable and understandable, we will always be leaving out use cases uh, from the edges. We need to get back to them at some point. Uh, and the, the last one, design for JSON-LD uh, and design for it consistently. So you can do this particular um, test at home. Um, if you go to Google Trends and put in JSON API and XML API, that is the graph that you, that you get. You can see pretty clearly XML APIs are, if not dead, then very close to it. And over the last uh, 15 years, JSON-based APIs have gone from nothing to the be all and end all. JSON-LD then encodes RDF and linked data in a format that is usable by and understandable by, most importantly, developers, because that's what they're used to in the rest of the web. You know, build it and they will come doesn't work, because everyone goes to the big cities. Right? You can build a lovely little village. All the houses are pristine, but no one's there. So you need to build um, systems that are in the city. It's where everyone else is. So by doing JSON-LD, rather than, say, Turtle or RDFXML, um, you can get to um, the 10 to 20% of all websites in the world uh, that include RDF now uh, via schema.org. Uh, they proved that with the common crawl um, data set, which is some billions of websites, uh, so it's, and a reasonably representative sample of the web. And the references are there for people who care. So this comes back um, to a wonderful blog post by Manu Sporny. If you Google um, nuclear RDF, you will find it um, and read it, please, uh, which I also give um, credit to Manu for essentially kicking off this idea of usable data, uh, that developers treat RDF like nuclear power. It's super powerful. It's almost free, and they do not want it in their backyard because they're afraid it's going to explode. Which I can, having run triple stores, I can understand. So yeah, when, when developers hear RDF, they think, not in my backyard. And that's the um, thing that we want to avoid with uh, JSON-LD and have successfully done with 1.0. Um, in June of this year, uh, there is a new working group in the W3C for JSON-LD 1.1 to take what we've learned of, with using JSON-LD over the last five years um, and 
uh, add a new minor version to fix some, f some issues where it w the spec wasn't clear, um, and also to add some new features uh, that it will be backwards compatible with the existing, existing spec, uh, but add even more developer happiness uh, into the ecosystem. Uh, if you're a W3C member, I encourage you to be involved. So, to, to summarize, some insights to take away. A, B, C, D, E. Abstraction, right abstraction, few barriers to entry, comprehensible data, documentation, 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 and as few exceptions as possible. The flip side of those, you'll get to the right abstraction by requiring use cases. As simple as possible, but no simpler, means that you have few barriers to entry. Don't break the web. That just goes without saying. Define success in your documentation rather than failure so that then you can have extensions and experimentation. And be consistent. Use JSON-LD because that's what the developers expect. Define patterns. Uh, define your own internal standards that are essentially application profiles of JSON-LD plus your ontology. Um, JSON-LD has tons of ways that you can make this as, as friendly as you, as you possibly can. So, in short, ensure that your data is loud, not just lot. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>